Hello Internet, so nice to see you. Today we're going to talk about intervals. Now guitar players on YouTube and on all the internet in general seem to have both a fascination about intervals and a confusion about how interval work on guitar. So I think there is the need of a video to clarify exactly how interval works. Now there is nothing super advanced in this video, but I think it's important for anybody to really understand how interval works so that you can start making music and you can understand more complex music theory that will help you make even more interesting music. Now, an interval is simply a way to measure the distance between two notes. This seems simple, but we get immediately into a complication. Let's take two notes as an example. Let's take the notes C and G. The interval between those two notes, the distance between those two notes, it's called a perfect fifth. And we're gonna see later why it's called this way. At the same time though, if you try to find those notes on your guitar, for instance, you can play your C note on the fifth string, third fret, and your G note on the same string at the tenth fret, and so you can see they are seven frets away, which also means they are seven half steps away. So we have two notes that are seven half steps away, but we call their distance a perfect fifth. Uh, I can see why some people are confused by that. So let's explain it this way. Let's suppose you have the C major scale. C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Now we're gonna start always from the C note and we're gonna name all the intervals in this scale. So the interval between the C note and the D note is gonna be called a major second. Why a second? Because as you see, this interval includes two notes in the scale. The interval between the C note and the E note is gonna be called a major third. As you see, in the major scale, this interval span three notes and that's why it's called a third. The interval between the C and the F note is going to be called a perfect fourth. Now, I know you were expecting me to call it a major fourth. I mean, this would be the consistent naming because we are all taking interval from the major scale. But humor me here, this will make sense later. The interval between C and G is going to be called the perfect fifth. The interval between C and A is going to be called a major sixth. The interval between C and B is going to be called a major seventh. And the interval between this C and the next C is going to be called an octave. Now, of course, if the distance between C and D is a second, we can also define a distance between C and the same C note, which can be called either a unison or a first. So now, if you're following me so far, the interval is a way to indicate the distance between two notes, and that distance is measured inside a scale. You see that the name, second, third, fourth, etc., relates to how many notes there are in between the two notes we want, including the first note and the last note. But the interval is not the only way to measure the distance between two notes, and that's where some confusion happens. Because I can also measure the distance between two notes in half steps. So for instance, the major second, C to D, is two half step. The major third, the C to E, it's four half step. The perfect fourth, C to F, it's five half step. The perfect fifth, C to G, it's seven half steps. The major sixth, C to A, it's nine half steps. The major seven, C to B, it's eleven half steps. And the octave, C to the next C, it's twelve half steps. Those are just two different ways to measure the distance between two notes, and sometimes one is more appropriate than the other. We have two systems because we need both in music. Now, as we have seen, some intervals in the major scale, like the second, third, sixth, and seventh, are called major, while some other interval, like the fourth, the fifth, and the octave, are called perfect. So here's another definition for you. If I take a major interval and I shrink it by one half step, I get a minor interval. How can I do that? Well, I can take C and E, which is a major third, and I can, for instance, flat the E. So the interval between C and E flat, it's now one half step shorter, it's just three half steps now, and so it's gonna be called a minor third. Or I can take the same C and E note and instead sharp the C. So the interval between C sharp and E is again a minor third. 
I cannot really do this with the perfect intervals. Those intervals will work in a slightly different way. If I take a perfect fifth, for instance, and I shrink it by a half step, like between C and G flat, I don't get a minor fifth. I get instead what is called a diminished fifth. And if instead I take an interval of a perfect fifth and I expand it by a half step, like between C and G sharp, now I get an augmented fifth. Occasionally, I can do the same also with major and minor intervals. So for instance, if I take a minor third, like C and D flat, and I shrink it again by another half step, like between C sharp and E flat, I get what is called a diminish third. Potentially, I can also go in the other direction. I could take a major third, C and E, and expand this interval by a half step, like between C and E sharp, and in this case, I would get an augmented third. Now, for various reasons, augmented thirds are not particularly common, but for instance, diminished thirds can happen every now and then. A diminished third, like between C sharp and E flat, has a distance of two half steps. And it seems then to be the same as a major second. So what is the difference? Well, the major second, as we see here, is like between C and D. The two notes are close by in the scale. There is no other note between C and D in the C major scale. While if you call an interval a diminished third, like between C sharp and E flat, you are implying that in whatever scale you are using, there is another note in between them, and this note can only be D. Depending on the musical situation, a diminished third will sound different than a major second because the context in which you play those notes is different, and so your brain will interpret this sound in a different way. Anyway, the important point here is this. If you take a major interval and you shrink it by one half step, you get a minor, and if you shrink again, you get a diminished interval. And if you take a major interval and you expand it by one half step, you get an augmented interval. If you take a perfect interval and you shrink it by one half step, you get a diminished interval. And if instead you take a perfect interval and you expand it by one half step, you get an augmented interval. In other words, some intervals, the second, the third, the sixth, and the seventh, exist in two different versions, major and minor. And some other interval, like the fourth, the fifth, and the octave, exist in only one version, the perfect version, and then all of those intervals can be expanded or contracted to become augmented or diminished. Now, one thing we do often with interval is that we can invert them. We do an inversion of an interval. What is that? Well, let's say I'm playing a C note and an E note, and as we know, their interval is a major third. Let's play those two notes in a different way now. I'm playing the same E, but instead of playing the C I used before, I'm playing the C at a higher octave. I just inverted the interval, meaning that before the C was the lowest note, now C is the highest note. Before E was the highest note, now E is the lowest note. But doing that, I changed the interval, because the distance between this E and the next C, it's not a major third, it's something different. Well, how do we know what is this interval? Here's how you do it. To find out the new interval, you take the number 9 and you subtract the original interval. So for instance, the original interval was a third, 9 minus 3 equals 6, so the new interval is a sixth. Also, major interval invert into minor interval, perfect interval invert into perfect interval, and augmented interval invert into diminished interval. C to E was a major third, so E to C it's a minor sixth because major interval invert into minor and vice versa. Let's do this for all the notes in the scale. C to D it's a major second. 9 minus 2 it's 7, and major inverse to minor, so D to C, it's a minor seventh. C to F, it's a perfect fourth. Nine minus four is five, so F to C, it's a fifth, and a perfect interval invert into a perfect interval, so F to C, it's a perfect fifth. C to G, it's a perfect fifth. Nine minus five is four, so G to C will be a four, and since the original interval was a perfect interval, the new interval is a perfect interval too, so G to C is a perfect fourth. C to A is a major sixth. 9 minus 6 is 3, so A to C is a third, and since C to A was a major sixth, A to C is a minor third. C to B is a major seventh. 
9 minus 7 is 2, so b to c is a second, and since c to b is a major 7, b to c is a minor second. Inverting intervals happen pretty often in real life music, so the more fluent you are with this, the better. Now, with all these, we can finally build a table of conversion between a distance in half step and a distance expressed in interval. So here it is. A distance of zero half steps, so c to c, it's a unison or a first. A distance of one half step, so like c to d flat, it's a minor second. A distance of two half steps, like c to d, it's a major second. A distance of three half step could be a minor third if I call my notes C and E flat, but it could also be an augmented second if I call my notes C and D sharp. Names are important here, again, because if I called my note here E flat, there is another note in between the, the, two, the C and the E flat, so this is an interval of a third, but if I call my note a D sharp, I imply there is no other note between the C and the D sharp, so that's a second, and the distance is wider than a normal major second, so I need to call this an augmented second. A distance of four half step, C to E, it's a major third. A distance of five half step, C to F, it's a perfect fourth. A distance of six half steps could be either a diminished fifth, C to G flat, or an augmented fourth, C to F sharp. A distance of seven half step, it's a perfect fifth, C to G. A distance of eight half steps could be either a minor sixth, C to A flat, or an augmented fifth, C to G sharp. A distance of nine half steps could be a major sixth, C to A, but in music sometimes you also find that this is a diminished seventh, C to B flat flat, or B double flat, a distance of 10 half steps could be a minor 7th, C to B flat, or an augmented 6th, C to A sharp. A distance of 11 half steps, C to B, it's a major 7th, and a distance of 12 half steps, C to the next C, it's a perfect octave. Now, you may notice that I haven't been perfectly consistent in here. I haven't indicated all the augmented and diminished interval. I choose to indicate only those because those are the most common augmented and diminished interval that you can find in music. It's quite rare, for instance, to find a diminished second or an augmented third. Again, it can happen, but those are quite rare. The one I indicated here are the most common. Interestingly enough, the diminished seven and the augmented sixth are actually pretty common in real life music, and they create specific chords. The diminished seventh, it's an important ingredient of the diminished seventh chord. It has a whole chord named about it, and the augmented sixth has a whole family of chord named from it, the family of the augmented sixth chord. Those tend to happen again pretty often in in real music. Again, all of this is a way to measure the distance between two notes. Then how do you use all that, and how does interval play together, and how they come together to make music? That's a much, much longer thing to do. If you're interested in that, I totally recommend you guys have a look at my course, Complete Chord Mastery. In Complete Chord Mastery, we learn together about harmony and chords on guitar. We take everything from the very beginning, we do the basics the right way, which is the most important thing to actually understand what's going on after. After, and everything is explained straight on the fretboard, there are no piano examples, and not only that, but every concept is explained both in theory and with exercises, so that you can implement everything you learn immediately in your playing, you can hear how it sounds, you can see how this works straight on your fretboard, and you can actually use it. It is a course of music theory, but it's what I call practical theory. If you have just a minute, click on the link on the top right and check out Complete Chord Mastery. If you like this video, smash on that like button and don't forget to subscribe, and if you have any feedback, comments, suggestions, or requests for new videos, write them down in the comment. I really enjoy reading from you. This is Tommaso Zillia of MusicTheoryForGuitar.com, and until next time, enjoy!